Day 25, Lord's Day 25 in the Book of Praise, uh, is uh, found on page 539. You can see the title above it, Word and Sacraments. So sacraments that we'll focus more on, but we'll still go through the whole Lord's Day together. Lord's Day 25 asks, and we confess together, since then faith alone makes us share in Christ and all his benefits, where does this faith come from? From the Holy Spirit, who works it in our hearts by the preaching of the gospel and strengthens it by the use of the sacraments. Now, what are the sacraments? The sacraments are holy, visible signs and seals. They were instituted by God so that by their use, he might the more fully declare and seal to us the promise of the gospel. And this is the promise that God graciously grants us forgiveness of sins and everlasting life because of the one sacrifice of Christ accomplished on the cross. Are both the Word and the sacraments then intended to focus our faith on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross as the only ground of our salvation? Yes, indeed. The Holy Spirit teaches us in the gospel and assures us by the sacraments that our entire salvation rests on Christ's one sacrifice for us on the cross. How many sacrifices, sacraments has Christ instituted in the new covenant? Two, holy baptism and the holy supper. This is the catechism summary of what God's word teaches about the sacraments in general in Lord's Day 25. And then after the ministry of the word, we hope to respond by singing of the work of the Holy Spirit in Him. 48. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, perhaps some of you shop Amazon or other online stores pretty often and even get pretty major purchases, even fragile purchases in the mail. And often you're kind of looking out the window when one of those fragile purchases come in because you know the guy's going to come and you hope he's placing it down carefully. Because usually those fragile purchases have those stickers on them, right? Handle with care. And the point being, we have to be very careful with what's inside. We don't want to handle it too roughly, go too extreme in one way or, or another because something might break. It's language that we use also in, in Scripture. The Apostle Paul, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, talks to his protege, Timothy, minister, and says, you know, handle with care the word of truth. If you're going to preach it, you have to be careful with it. Don't Use it too extremely. Uh, make sure you're doing it in a balanced way. Now, there, there's no text in the Bible that matches our theme for this afternoon, handle the sacraments well. There's no place where the Apostle Paul tells Timothy or some other person like Titus or Philemon, handle the sacraments rightly. Uh, and I'm not trying to, to claim that this afternoon. And yet, when you look at the history of the church, it is something that we probably could use a reminder of regularly. Because often when it comes to the sacraments and you go through church history, you're going to find times where people don't handle the sacraments all that well. In fact, it leads to all kinds of controversies. It leads to all kinds of divisions, all centered around how we look at these holy events that God gives us to use as a church. They, they're, the sacraments are still today sometimes minefields if we're not careful, even when we agree with which ones they are, the Lord's Supper and baptism, uh, even when we agree with the confessions over and over again, what they're supposed to do, what they mean, how they function. We still can get into knots a little bit over questions like, should we, uh, when we have people that are shut in in their homes, should we try to celebrate the Lord's Supper with them somehow, even if they can't go to church anymore? Should we, we bring it to them? And people can get pretty animated on both sides of that discussion. Or should we delay baptism for a little bit in order to get our own minister on the pulpit? Or maybe for some other reason. When, what's legitimate? What's not? Uh, people can have some pretty strong opinions on that as well. 
it can get touchy pretty quickly. And as we go through Lord's Day 25, it's not my job here this afternoon to spout my opinions on those kinds of questions. Uh, what's important, though, is to go back to the principles underlying the sacraments and know them really well so that we can handle the sacraments well when it comes to different points of discussion, different questions that we come up against in practical life when it comes to the sacraments. And thankfully, the church has been through some even tougher questions before when it comes to the sacraments. And saints of the past, studying the scriptures, uh, working through what the scriptures say about the sacraments, have written down some key principles for us of how to handle the sacraments well. And a lot of those come out in Lord's Day 25. So we're going to look at two of the dangers that we end up facing when it comes to handling uh, the sacraments. And it's really almost the two opposite dangers. Almost like we're trying to steer a course then of balancing the sacraments well and not veering off to the one side of, of making them too important and off to the other side of making them not important enough. So we'll look at the two dangers as our two points this afternoon, starting with the danger of making sacraments too important. And to start with then, it's good for us to just understand where this... Uh, where the topic of sacraments, why it comes up in the first place in the catechism. I, I understand that Emmanuel is not going through the Lord's Days leading up to Lord's Day 25 this afternoon, so if you just glance back, perhaps you know them well, Lord's Days uh, 23 and 24 are coming out of the Apostles' Creed, which, what's the Apostles' Creed when it comes to the catechism? It's a summary of what we're supposed to believe. Because, well, believing... Having faith is part of our deliverance. Faith in Jesus Christ. Believing the things of the Apostles' Creed, the things that we say there, that's kind of the, the heart of what our faith should be based on. And so faith is extremely important. And basically, Lord's Days 23 and 24 just hit that message home even more so. It really is by faith alone in Jesus Christ. It's all Him it's not our works. And all kinds of questions are asked about, well, do works have a little bit of value here or a little bit of value here? And it's, no, no, no. It's by faith. So that the conclusion, if you look at the top of Lord's Day 25, the question, there's the lesson from the previous Lord's Days. Since then, faith alone makes us share in Christ and all his benefits. That's the conclusion. Faith alone makes us share in Christ and all his benefits. So, the resulting question, how do we get it? Well, we need it. We need it in order to be saved. Where does it come from? And the answer, as I read it and as we confessed it in our hearts, uh, is from the Holy Spirit. And you notice as it goes through it, the next two things that it says, uh, they're... There's, there's two parts to it, but they're not this one and this one are where you get faith. There's a distinction in the wording in this answer that makes it uh, obvious that there's a priority within these two parts. Look at answer 65. It says, it's from the Holy Spirit who does what? He works that faith in our hearts by the preaching of the gospel. And then, it's a separate point, he strengthens it by the use of the sacraments. And the difference there is that the word works it in our hearts and the words strengthens it. The one works it, the other strengthens it. So there's a priority here to the preaching of the gospel. We acknowledge all of this is done by the Holy Spirit. It's not anything we do on our own. It's not something we conjure up on our own. We don't work faith in our own hearts. Paul says in Ephesians 2 that faith itself is a gift of grace. Uh, 2 verse 8. The Holy Spirit begins this work, but he does that by the preaching of the gospel. The, sac the sacraments he does not use to work it in our hearts. That's a separate thing. The start of our faith, it gets worked in our hearts by the preaching of the gospel. And that comes from uh, passages like Romans 10 especially. Uh, you can look at it, it makes it clear that you can't hear and understand anything about God, anything about the gospel, unless it's first preached to you. 
How can you hear if, you haven't, if it hasn't been preached to you? How are people to believe in him of whom they have not heard, says Paul in Romans 10 verse 14. You need to hear it in order to believe it. So the word, the preaching of the gospel and its truths, they need to continue to be spoken. We need to continue to have preaching Sunday after Sunday. That's why the church and the leadership of the church regularly provides the word Sunday after Sunday, formally off the pulpits like this, so that the Holy Spirit works through it and starts working faith in our hearts. That's the, the formal way and the, the regular way that the Holy Spirit works. We would also admit that the, the Holy Spirit can work uh, faith in people's hearts uh, through the, the work of the gospel in, in other ways as well. Because after all, the, the heart of what he's working with is this, the message of the gospel, the, the saying of the gospel. So if the gospel gets said in a conversation or in a Bible study or through fellowship and, and devotions, through times of prayer, through listening to speeches or attending conferences, there can still be ways in which our faith can, can be worked in our hearts uh, in, in limited ways that way, in informal ways, we would say. But that only works because those things would be pointing to what the preaching of the gospel does every Sunday which is point you to the cross of Jesus Christ, point you to his great work of salvation that we're supposed to believe in. The preaching then has a, a foundational priority. It's what we need in order to, to have faith come. The Holy Spirit says he's going to use that tool. And so we keep it with that priority. It's what we need. So where does that lead the sacraments? I said there's a difference. Uh, well, again, the Holy Spirit doesn't work faith in our hearts by the sacraments. The Lord's Supper and baptism, the two sacraments we believe Jesus Christ has instituted, uh, they may be in this section in the catechism that is described as our deliverance, but that, that almost can be misleading because they don't deliver us. They don't give you saving faith. That's the preaching that gives you saving faith. We don't need them in the same way that we need the preaching. That's the main way in which they're different. And then if we, we zoom back and start looking throughout church history and, and talk about handling the sacraments well, well, that's the exact problem that you find all over the place especially in the 1500s when the, the catechism was written, but we still find it all over the place today. So if you go back to Martin Luther and reformers like him, like John Calvin, uh, they were going back to the scriptures themselves and noticing that the church had somehow kind of shifted into a phase where the sacraments had taken on a life and importance of their own. Sacraments, they saw, were supposed to be signs. And signs as I think we all know, are not the things themselves. You drive down the road, you see a sign that says curve ahead. You don't think that that's the curve that the sign is talking about. You know that there's a different curve outside of that sign that you should be looking at. Like a musical note on a page is the sign of a sound, and that note on the page is not the sound itself. Or like the maple leaf is a symbol of Canada, but nobody would mistake a maple leaf on a flag for the actual country of Canada. These are signs that speak of a, a reality outside of themselves. That's what the sacraments were supposed to be. God would often give signs all over the scriptures, really, Old Testament, New Testament, to prove that what he was saying, what he was speaking and promising was actually true. We read from that Christmas passage in Luke 2 that all the kids know really well. Some of them memorize it for Christmas concerts and things like that. And the angel says those famous words, this will be a sign for you. And the kids know what that sign was. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling claws and lying in a manger. That sign, that wasn't the big deal. The big deal was that the, the, the Savior of the world had come. There was a promise that came right before it in Luke chapter 2. Uh, the angels said, uh, Behold, a Savior is born this day in the city of Bethlehem. That's 
That's the big deal. The sign is just added to prove to the shepherds that that promise is actually true. So the shepherds, you know, they, they go and they go to Bethlehem and they find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. They see the sign, but they don't go and start telling everybody, look at this sign, we saw a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths. That's not what they're going off and rejoicing about when they're going off and telling people what they saw at the end of that passage. They're telling people that the Savior of the world has come and that they know it's him because the sign proved it. It just, it made the promise that was so glorious all the more certain, all the more sure. So everybody, get on board here. The Savior of the world is here. That's how signs were supposed to work. And the Lord's Supper then and baptism work in the same way. Uh, The Lord's Supper is a sign of what Jesus did in dying on the cross for us and for our sins. It's not actually Jesus Christ crucifying himself all over again, but it's done in remembrance of him so that the words that the, the preacher says off the pulpit all the time about Jesus Christ dying for the forgiveness of your sins, his blood being poured out for your sake, that that actually gets shown. And as certainly as that is given to you, that that forgiveness, that promise is yours. And baptism in the same way. We hear that our, our sins are washed away. Baptism itself doesn't wash it away. It's not Jesus' blood being poured out again, but it's a sign of the promises that come with it. Now, to, to get to the point, going back to the 1500s, the issue at that time was that if you didn't get baptized, or if you didn't celebrate the Lord's Supper, well, you're in deep trouble. They're, they're, you're, uh, it's, it's a scary place that you're in. Your sins are not going to be washed away if you're not baptized. If you don't celebrate the Mass, you're not forgiven. Listen to this from the, the Acts of the Council of Trent. Uh, that's a, a Roman Catholic synod, basically. Uh, that the leaders of the Roman Catholic Church held in around the same time as the Reformers were, were beginning to talk about how the Roman Catholic Church was, was teaching the wrong things. So these leaders of the Roman Catholic Church met and tried to sort through some of these teachings of the Reformers and make judgments on them. Uh, and this is canon number eight from the Council of Trent. It says, If anyone says that grace is not conferred by the sacraments of the new law, Uh, through the sacramental action itself. But if anyone says instead that faith in the divine promises is by itself sufficient for obtaining grace, let him be anathema. So it's it's in the negative. It's, It's basically saying, let anyone be cursed and basically considered outside of the church if they teach that salvation is only by faith alone. And if they teach that there's no saving work in the sacraments, that there's no grace that is conferred, that that you don't get grace from the sacraments. If anyone teaches that, let them be kicked out. This sign for them does something. If you don't get it, you don't get forgiven. The action of it saves. And so the reformers started writing against that and were considered anathema, kicked out of the church, and destined for hell by the Roman Catholic Church, even though the Reformers were trying to go back to the Scriptures. But regardless, the the Roman Catholic, I don't want to necessarily pick on them this afternoon, Uh, the ironic thing is that there were also people reforming at the time, getting away from the Roman Catholic Church, that also still didn't handle the sacraments properly. We describe them in that day and age as the radical Anabaptists. They ended up doing a lot of the same things when it comes to the sacraments. Uh, Listen to these words from a short Anabaptist confession in around uh, 1610. So around the same time, they wrote this, uh, the sacraments are the invisible spiritual act of God through Christ in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, bringing the new birth, justification, 
spiritual nourishment and sustenance to repentant and believing souls. So it actually does something. It's the spiritual act of God bringing new birth, bringing changes, bringing justification. If you don't get it, you're not brought justification. You're not saved. Again, the the sacrament is still doing the same work. Even though they're trying to get away from the Roman Catholic Church, they're still looking at baptism in the same way, that it does something. And you've got to get yourself baptized to get that thing. Both sides, the the Latin word for this teaching or this kind of looking or view of the, the sacraments is called ex opera operato, which simply means From the deed, the deed is done. So from the thing, it's done. From the sacrament being given, the saving is done. But both sides here, whether both sides are are basically making the same mistake, putting too much emphasis on the power of the sacrament so that without it, you're not saved. You need it, and, and if you don't get it, you should be worried. It's how you get salvation. And it makes them so essential that you can't live without them, no matter what. And so the reformers in that time, well, they started arguing against things like priests having to rush in and baptize infants before they died because they argued, those those infants, they don't need that in order to be saved. Those infants are already in Christ by being children of believing parents. The sacrament is just a sign of what already is a reality. You don't have to also, you don't have to rush to the deathbed and perform last rites because the person needs to be forgiven their last sins before they die. No, they've already been prepared to die when they first believed and were justified. They're saved already. And all of that then provides us with some caution today when it comes to how we handle the sacraments. It can easily happen that we begin to, we begin to, to ritualize them or uh, command them to the point that they become almost essential to our membership or essential to our, in connection with that, essential to our salvation. At least that it, it's implied by how highly we treat them. When that's simply not the case. They're not needed in that way. And we'll get to the opposite danger in a moment of not giving them enough importance. But for now, the point the catechism is trying to make in its day, and the point we need to remember still today, is to make sure we keep the role of the sacraments under the Word in terms of supporting what the Word teaches, confirming it. It's not what saves you, the sacraments. And we have to look out for attitudes that creep in, even with the best of intentions, that would make these things more than they were made to be. Our salvation is in Jesus Christ alone and the message of his salvation, faith in him. That comes from the word. When we believe in that message and are justified, there, there's no going back. We, we've been made righteous before God. It's done. Uh, no sacrament does that for us. No sacrament actually gives the promises. They're already ours in Christ. And really, that's what the sacraments are supposed to do, is only just reaffirm that. Point us back to what is essential. That's the whole point of of question and answer 67 in the catechism. The word and the sacraments are intended to focus our faith on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as the only ground of our salvation. That's what we need, that sacrifice and the promises that come with it. Yes, indeed. It's assured us by the sacraments that really our entire salvation rests on the sacrifice. That's what's essential. That's where the Holy Spirit wants to direct our faith. So we know not to make then the sacraments the be-all and the end-all. They're not that important in that sense. But now let's flip the page a little bit and go to our second point and watch out that we don't go flying off the rails the other way by making them too unimportant. 
our second point. Maybe the classic example of this, at least in the time of the Reformation, uh, was the way at least that a lot of historians paint the teachings of the Swiss reformer, uh, Ulrich Zwingli. Maybe some people remember learning about the different views on the Lord's Supper, and you kind of have the Roman Catholic view on the one end, and the Lutherans are pretty similar, transubstantiation and consubstantiation. And then you hear that then there's also this Ulrich Zwingli fellow, but he was going a little bit off the other way. He just said that the Lord's Supper, you know, Jesus Christ, uh, the, the Roman Catholics had it wrong. Jesus Christ isn't in the meal physically. But then Zwingli just said, well, it's just a rem- memorial meal. We just remember. And just remember Jesus. That's what the Lord's Supper is about. And that's it. And that's probably an oversimplification of what Ulrich Zwingli taught. But it gets at the point. We can almost, uh, we can almost think about the Lord's Supper in such a way that we, we miss out on or completely forget that there is more going on with it as a sacrament. It's, it's not simply a sign. That sign has power with it. And question and answer 65, it, it's really speaking to that power that sacraments have when it says that faith is strengthened by the sacraments or by their use. Something powerful happens. Faith doesn't just sit there and stay the same the whole time. No, it's actually strengthened. It's trained. It's built up. So if you're struggling, if you're having doubts, if you're feeling distant from God, if you have temptations in your life that make you feel guilty and you, you just you don't feel worthy anymore to, to be chosen by God or forgiven by God, your, your faith, you would say, is weak at that time. God with the work of the Holy Spirit, gives you the sacraments to help you through that time, to build you up, to refresh you so that your faith goes up. And that's what signs, again, throughout the scriptures, were meant to do. Signs weren't just given for the fun of it as a little add-on to say, hey, look, I can do a miracle too. And not only can I, uh, uh, you know, provide the promise of a savior to the world, I can also very nicely make it strange by having a baby wrapped up in a manger. No, it's, it's way more than that. When the shepherds see the baby wrapped in the manger, that confirms to them, it seals to them. They know it for sure that what the angel said about this child being the savior of God, as sent by God for the world, that that was true. Because how often do you walk in on a baby in a manger? It's not a very common occurrence. That's the sign. And you can go back. Go back to Abram. When he was doubting his future in the book of Genesis, God sent him the visible sign of God walking through the cut up animals as a smoking fire pot. And that sealed to Abraham that what God had said was true. Think of uh, Moses getting ready to speak in front of Pharaoh and not wanting to do that. I'm not a worthy speaker. I can't do that, O Lord. And what does God do? He sends signs. He can put his his hand inside his his jacket and pull it out and his leprous and he puts it back in, pulls it out and it's clean again. Or throw his, his, his staff down on the ground, turns into a snake and then back again. Or take uh, Gideon and the, the time he had to go and, and use a very tiny army in order to fight a massive Midianite army. And he says, Lord, I don't know if I can trust you. He's doubting and God sends him two signs. The signs of the fleece getting wet and the ground dry and the sign of the, dra- the ground being wet and the fleece drying. And he knows. Think of the wise men and the star. They know. Signs then are not just signs. They're beautiful gifts which help us in our times of doubt. They help us trust more in God. We should just trust his word. We should be able to hear the message on any given Sunday and be, yes, I know it. I know it's true. But God still comes to us in grace and says, I know you struggle even with that. Here's a sign to make it more sure for you. So there's power in it. 
There's a way in which he uses it powerfully for us. Now, of course, we, we read from Isaiah 7, and that's one of the more interesting instances uh, because here in, in Isaiah 7, we read about Ahaz, who has this army coming at his capital city of Jerusalem, an army of two nations, Israel in the north and the Syrians have combined with them, an allied force. And it doesn't look like he's going to stand any chance. It even says at one point that he, he trembled or shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. He's pretty scared. And God comes and sends Isaiah and says, don't worry about it. Yes, they have this plan to try and ransack your city, but it shall not stand. It shall not come to pass. And that's when God offers Ahaz a sign to say, Ahaz, I promise this is going to happen. They're not going to do it. They're not going to be able to conquer your city. I'll give you any sign. I'll give you a sign. Uh, try me, basically. The, a sign as deep as Sheol or a sign as high as heaven, wherever you want it, whatever you want it to be. But then you get Ahaz saying, almost piously you would think, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Well, what's going on there? Ahaz, we find out in other passages of Scripture, especially in Second Kings, Ahaz has been busy gathering all the money that he can get, including from the temple treasury, and he's been trying to pay off a neighboring king to help him out, and that neighboring army is coming. So he doesn't, he doesn't really care that much about turning to the Lord in prayer and seeking God's help. He's much more interested in making sure that that money got there and that that army is actually going to make it. So he's not being all that pious when he, he's not asking God for a sign. If anything, he's showing that He's not going to give God the credit for this anyways. God offers a sign through his prophet, and Ahaz, what does he do? He devalues it. He doesn't think it's all that important. He doesn't think it's going to make him trust in God at all. And so he doesn't care about it at all. And that shows us that there is, again, a danger that we don't value the signs for what they are. God here wants to give this gift, and he gets upset when he has rejects the gift. God wants to give us the gift of the Lord's Supper, wants to give us the gift of, of baptism to strengthen our faith, because he knows we struggle. He knows our faith wavers. And for us then to treat that as if it's nothing, to treat it as if well, you can do whatever you want with it, whenever you want with it. That's belittling the gift that God has given us. Because God, it's, it, it's almost, you could in, in that way say, he, he's giving us something we don't deserve. He has already given up his son Jesus Christ for us. He has already done everything to prove that he loves us. What greater sign than you, do you need for him to give up his only son for you? And yet, knowing our weakness, knowing our, our frailty, knowing how fickle we are in going one way and the other and believing sometimes and not believing another time, he still says, well, I'll give you a sign as well. Receive that bread and that wine. Uh, get that water poured on your head. And, and as simply as that happens, as my church goes out and, and gives that to people, so certainly that's yours. That's proof that my promises about the forgiveness of sins are yours. God wants for us to value these sacraments. So you think back to your baptism or you, you see another baptism. And, and if you've been struggling to trust that you've been just washed completely clean, that you're, you're not dirty in God's sight, you see that as a gift, God saying, no, you really are washed, all of it. Or if you're struggling to trust that Christ loves you enough to die for you, look at him coming to you in the Lord's Supper and saying, here, this is for you. I, I am, this is Christ coming to you. I do love you and I want to renew that love by giving you this. He's willing. Those signs, they are just signs. They don't save you, but they're beautiful gifts. When you take them by faith, you really do grow. 
And add to that, that Jesus Christ wanted us to do these things because he commanded them, do this in remembrance of me, he says when he's holding the bread and the wine, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. It all goes to show that it would be equally dangerous to slough them off as not that big a deal. Who are we to belittle God's good gifts or act like we don't need them or wouldn't benefit from them? Yes, they aren't the word. They aren't the promises themselves. They don't save us. We don't need them in the same way. But that doesn't mean we don't value them or it doesn't mean we don't uh, hold them in, in high esteem. No, we value that strengthening. We desire it. We crave it. And when God gives it, we savor it. We soak it in. It's a reminder of his love. Hopefully you can begin to see then, brothers and sisters, why it can be difficult to always handle the sacraments well. As human beings, we're constantly fighting against urges to, to do one or the other, make, make the sacraments too big, make it something that I can just check off my list and get my salvation in because they're important and God wants me to do them and if I do them, I'm saved. No, but we can also go the other way and make them too small and, and minimize them. And the scriptures show us, the catechism summarizes that the principle is, is to find that balance, to see them as the gift of grace that, uh, that God has meant them to be, confirming the promises. That then can start guiding us when we face questions about Lord's Supper for shut-ins or delaying baptisms or, or other such controversies that we can still run into in these things. We want to be mulling over this principle of where the dangers are at so that we're handling them rightly. And what the Catechism continues to remind us is that we need each day again to wake up and put front and center in our lives that hope, that comfort, that all of our salvation is found at the cross in Jesus Christ. God has given us many good gifts that we can get distracted with in this life. And the sacraments, you can almost add to that list. God has, God has given us the uh, gifts that we end up uh, just falling in love with. Uh, the gift of money, the gift of family, the gift of, of work, the gift of rest, the gift of play, the gift of sexuality, the gift of beauty, the gift of music, the gift of sports. The, the gifts of, of technology. Uh, I could go on and on and on. There are so many gifts that God gives us and we can use them for good and they would be received by grace in that sense. But we take them and we make them into idols. Things that we think will satisfy us, that will fulfill us, that will make us happy. And in that sense, you'd almost say would save us. All besides Christ himself. But time and time again, God calls us back to get our central focus straight again. Get our, our mindset straight again on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's where we see true love. That's where we see true grace. That's where we see where our future lies because we've been set free. So as you receive the good gifts of the sacraments, may they only be used to point you, just as God wanted, to the great saving work he has done through his son, Jesus Christ. He alone is the center of our purpose, our world. All things are indeed from him and through him and to him and in him all things hold together. To him be the glory. Amen.